So today, indeed, I will talk about super resolution. And I will try to give a very high level uh, overview of the field and its advances, and then uh, show you how you can implement, I mean, not even implement, but utilize the latest state of the art model in PyTorch. So we're not going to build a, a model today. We'll see models that people, people have been building. I'll show you where you can find um, key papers on recent advances, and we'll look at the latest model. So just a, a few quick words, uh, quick terminology before we start. So LR stands for low resolution. So that's our input image. That's the image that we would like to upscale. HR is the real high resolution image. So you can start from high resolution images and then um, uh, reduce the resolution by applying some filter uh, or some uh, Bayesian methods and you can blur them artificially and then do some down sampling and create low resolution images from high re resolution images. So HR, HR in the literature is considered as the truth, so to speak. SR is the process of super resolution. So it's the attempt by algorithms or neural networks or other mechanisms to reconstruct HR from LR. So SR is our output. And um, to uh, assess how well a model or an algorithm is performing, for instance, we will compare SR, our output, with HR, which is the ground truth, or uh, come up with some other measures when the HR doesn't exist. Because uh, in some training scenario, you have a high resolution image that you turn into a low resolution one, and then you try to recreate the high resolution one. But then when you start applying your model in the real world, you don't have the high resolution image. You uh, create some SR image based on LR images. And so in order to assess how well our, mod, our result is, uh, how good our result is, we need to also have some metrics that allow to assess the quality of SR, even when we don't have HR. So we'll talk a little bit about metrics in the field of super resolution. And then um, what you'll see often in the literature is uh, the, the acronym SISR, which simply means single image super resolution, so that's simply super resolution when you use a single input image. So that's the real world application of SR in the vast majority of cases. So let's have um, a quick overview of the history of super resolution because it's far from being a recent field. Um, for a long time now, people have been trying to create uh, better resolution images from fairly low resolution image. And so if we look at the entire history, it can be broken down into two periods. One that is very long, and that saw some progress, but at, at a fairly slow pace. Uh, and that was until about 10 years ago, and that's before uh, deep neural networks came up. So it's a whole series of algorithms that um, uh, increased in complexity and gave better and better results. But the field wasn't moving all that fast. And then in the past 10 years, with the since the advent of deep learning, so deep neural networks, the, the field has really taken off uh, in some pretty wild ways. So if we look at the era that predates deep neural networks, well, there were all sorts of um, algorithms ranging from uh, nearest neighbor to some much more complex models. So what is, for instance, nearest neighbor interpolation? Well, you have a small image with a certain number of pixels. You want to turn it into a larger image with more pixels. So what you do is you stretch it up, and then you have to interpolate the missing pixel. That means you have to come up with some value for those missing pixels. So the simplest method by far is simply to copy the pixel value 
of the nearest pixel. So that doesn't even involve any calculation. And that's what nearest neighbor interpolation does. So as you can imagine, it's extremely fast since no computation is involved, but it's also uh, extremely rough. It, it gives pretty poor, very pixelized results with very jagged edges. Then you have methods a little bit more fancy, such as bicubic interpolation. And then the problem becomes, uh, the goal uh, becomes solving uh, this equation where you have to find all of those a, I, G uh, coefficients to try to solve this. So suddenly you have some computations involved, so it's a lot slower, but the results are better. And then all sorts of algorithms, more and more sophisticated and complex have come up to try to uh, calculate better values for the missing pixels that we are interpolating. But those are based on solving increasingly complex equations. They don't involve um, deep neural networks. But about 10 years ago, uh, deep neural networks came about. And deep neural networks have seen all sorts of architecture over the past 10 years. And key architectures have in turn been applied to the field of super resolution. So the very first neural networks that uh, got applied to the field of vision were called CNN or convolutional neural networks. And then the CNNs got um, paired, like two CNN started to compete with one another in what is called GAN or generative adversarial network, where you have one network that is the generator that comes up with something. So from noise, uh, it creates something, it creates an output, and then you have the discriminator, which tries to guess whether this is a genuine image or whether this is the output of the generator. And so it's called generative because we have the creation of new images. This is not as uh, earlier CNNs were about uh, image recognition or uh, trying to come up with some label for a scene. This is the actual creation of an image. And then it's called adversarial because you have those two networks that are adversaries, to, so to speak, that are fighting with each other because the uh, discriminator tries to guess whether the generator created the image or not. And as you run those networks, the generator becomes better and better at creating images, and the discriminator becomes better and better at discriminating, discriminating images. And I'm sure you all have heard of deepfake. Well, deepfake are GANs. So GANs, this idea of deepfake, so the creation of novel images, can, of course, be applied to super resolution. Because when we want to upscale an image, we are really creating a new image. Because all those pixels that we interpolate, um, they are being generated. And then the latest bit, and this is by far the most interesting, and this is the one we will look at more closely today, are transformers. So transformers, that's like the huge revolution in the field of deep learning that has occurred in recent times. And I'll talk about that um, in a few slides. So all of these have been applied to super resolution. And if you look at the literature for the past 10 years, there are a few really key papers, and um, all of these are hyperlinks. So you can, from the slides or from the PDF at your own pace, if you are interested, look into the literature. And a few of these papers were published in non-open source journals. But in any event, uh, you can always find the preprint uh, available open source on the archive um, website. For those who haven't uh, heard of this yet, this is the um, really the key database for open source literature in many fields, but in particular in machine learning. It's uh, put up by Cornell University, 
And this is really where you will be able to find, uh, no matter what your university subscription to the literature may or may not be, all of these papers. So, uh, as I mentioned, at first we had convolutional neural networks applied to uh, super resolution. So we had a model called SRCNN in 2014, then random forests uh, were applied uh, and a number of uh, less um, talked about architectures. And then we had the SRGAN, so the super resolution generative uh, adversarial networks and some all sorts of uh, sub flavors like the enhanced SRGAN or ESRGAN, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then at the very end, uh, Swing Transformer, which just came out this year, is really at this point the uh, top of the art when it comes to super resolution, state of the art. So SRCNN, <clears throat> Well, that's a CNN. So what is a convolutional neural network? It's a deep neural network, meaning a neural network that has multiple hidden layers between the input layer and the output layer. And what's particular about convolution, convolutional layers is that they don't um, uh, have the same shape and size. So in classic CNN, we want to decrease the number of computations that is performed. We don't want to uh, overburden the computing system, like the computers, with unnecessary computations. Images tend to be large. They have very many pixels. And also, images have specially autocorrelated. In an image, the uh, distribution of pixels isn't random. Like, for instance, if you have some sky, you're going to have a lot of blue in in one general area. So CNN tend in general to have mechanisms that uh, condense, so to speak, an entire area of the image into a single node, a single neuron, or a single, single calculation, for instance, by taking the mean or by taking the maximum value. And then you have what's called the stride that moves around that little uh, window uh, uh, on the, on the image. Now, SRCNN, unlike classic CNN, don't do that because in the case of super resolution, we don't want to compact anything. We are actually trying to interpolate new pixels because we want the output image to be larger than the input image. We're not trying to identify an object in an image. We want to come up with a bigger image. So those um, convolutional layers do uh, tend to do the opposite as what uh, other CNN do in that the nonlinear mapping, so the mapping uh, of one uh, neuron to the other one in a way that uh, isn't one for one, uh, usually tends to uh, increase the number of neurons produced. We, we are trying to uh, add some pixels there. And so you have some nonlinear mapping that tends to interpolate new uh, pixels in the result. So it's a little bit like those earlier methods uh, that we're doing, that we're using algorithms to come up with this, except that this is done inside the convolutional layers of a neural network. And so that means that if you feed your network a ton of data, so data to train a neural network has to be labeled data. So in this case, that would be some pairs of LR, HR, so low resolution, high resolution images. You, you kind of apply the same idea as what algorithms used to do, but in a much, much, much better way, because at each iteration of the neural network, thanks to uh, some loss function uh, that uh, gives some feedback to the network about its performance, we are getting better and better results. So now, SRGAN, uh, as I said again, this is like a totally different idea because we have those two competing networks, one that generates images and one that tries to see whether or not they are generated. And so 
SRDN um, has two networks, so the generator network and the discriminator network. This is the architecture of the SRDN uh, built in 2017 in one of those uh, key papers. And uh, so you have some convolutional layers, uh, you have some uh, real layers. Uh, I mean, they're not um, simple ReLU layer, some are leaky ReLU, because uh, um, just a little reminder, ReLU functions are uh, some functions that add some non-linearity in the neural network, because if through the neural network, all you do is multiply each node by some weight and add a bias, things remain linear. So if we want to actually achieve something, we need to um, add in there some non-linearity factor. And the ReLU function uh, does this because each positive value outputs itself, but each negative value outputs zero. And the bummer with ReLU is that you lose a lot of information. All those negative values uh, end up being dead neurons, so to speak, because they're all zero. So a leaky ReLU has gives uh, multiplies the negative values by some fixed coefficient so that um, it breaks the, li the linearity, but you have something going on in the negative. But the, the coefficient is fixed. So then there are some parametric ReLU, P ReLU in this um, network here it stands for parametric ReLU. And in that case, that coefficient for the negative values becomes a parameter. So it becomes something that, the, that you can modify. So it's a, it's a fancy ReLU. So you have common elements to architecture coming from CNN. I mean, those are CNN uh, networks. But by pairing two networks in an adversarial fashion, you get really astounding results. And then, so there are all sorts of other methods that have been implementing random forest and some subpixels models, and really there's a lot out there. But the, the key steps were CNN, GANs, and now Transformer. So let's talk a little bit about Transformer. And to talk about Transformer, we have to talk about attention. So the concept of attention uh, came up in this really, really key paper in 2014, it was in the field of vision, and people, this team, and, and all, I'm sure other people, were thinking that uh, the way the animal brain, for instance, the human brain functions, is that we, when we look at an image, we don't process every pixel in the same way. Uh, the world we are bombarded by information. The world is full of information. If we were indiscriminately treating all of that information, we would be highly dysfunctional because uh, even though the human brain or animal brains in general are insanely powerful uh, organs, uh, they're still limited. Their computing power also has a limit. And so we wouldn't be able to treat all of that information. The way evolution uh, has led to efficient brains is by making us totally uh, unconsciously, we, we do that automatically without paying attention to it, um, focus on what is relevant. So neurobiologists can look at the way the uh, human eye moves to see where the, the individual pays attention to in an image and see, try to get a proxy of how we treat visual information thanks to our eye movement. And this uh, led people in the domain of AI to think because so far, uh, neural networks, which were at the structural level influenced by the animal brain, uh, the artificial neuron is some form of approximation of the biological neuron, if you want. You have some inputs 
uh, in the uh, artificial case, they're weights, they're just numbers, but you have inputs uh, similar to uh, the, the stimuli that come to a, a biological neuron. And then you have some form of processing in the case of the artificial neural network is usually uh, some weighted mean of the weights plus a bias, and then pass that through some ReLU or other uh, function that breaks the linearity, and then you have an output. So structurally, things were influenced by the animal brain. But at the functional level, there wasn't uh, a lot of influence from the way the biological brain works until this idea of attention. So this team started to think that if those deep convolutional neural networks focus equally on um, the entire image, we are really losing a lot of uh, computational power uh, unnecessarily. And so they tried to apply this concept of attention where the human brain focuses its attention when we look at a visual signal such as an image to the neural network. And they came up in a paper cited uh, almost 3000 times with some kind of way to tell, to encode into a model that a house in a picture that has a house in a landscape, for instance, uh, the pixels of the house are the uh, point of interest in the picture. So they managed to, to create some kind of heat map, if you want, that allows the model based on the on some uh, coefficient to focus its computations specifically in areas of interest. So this concept of attention was really important. But where things exploded is in 2017, in a paper that has been coded almost 30, well, probably by now, because I looked at this a few days ago, uh, 31,000 times called attention is all you need. So what they did in this paper is that they took this attention concept uh, in the concept of neural networks and they try to simplify models. And by removing, uh, and instead of applying it to vision, because this first paper was about vision, they applied it in the, in the field of natural language processing or NLP. And in the field of natural language processing, instead of CNN, so instead of convolutional neural networks that are applied to vision, we had uh, what were called RNN. Um, recurrent neural network. They're called recurrent because instead of the information passing through the network from left to right uh, in a simple way, you had some loops going on. You had some gated uh, neurons that would send the information back. And this is how we were dealing with uh, language processing because in a sentence, for instance, instead of having the information uh, spatially correlated as in an image, the information is temporally correlated. The meaning of a sentence uh, doesn't just depend on the words in that sentence, but on the order of these words. And so those convolutions, those loops through the network were a way to try to extract that uh, temporal correlation information. But that had lots of issues. First, um, there were some very practical difficulties with the uh, loss function uh, dwindling or exploding. Or, so it was uh, not always easy to train those models. Also, the amount of training had to be uh, really, really high. And uh, finally, because of all these loops, because computations had to be applied in a particular sequence, 
it was impossible to parallelize those computations. So you couldn't make use of GPUs in an effective way with RNN. So this team in 2017 took this concept of attention from the visual world, applied it to a, an NLP model, and simplified the model. So they got rid of the recurrence. They got rid of all those gates. They got rid of all the complex uh, recurrent elements in the RNN architecture, and they realized that the result was still amazing. Hence the, the title, attention is all you need. So if you apply that concept of attention, that's all you need. You don't need all those recurrence. And so suddenly that solved everything. You could parallelize it because uh, you didn't need to have computations run in a particular sequence. Um, you didn't need to train as much. Uh, it was much easier to handle uh, the loss function. Um, so that was really uh, a big uh, turning point. And they created a novel architecture that is based on this concept of attention, and they called it the transformer. So in the past five years now, transformers have been really a, a brand new type of neural network architecture based on attention, which for the first time, I think, I mean, really functionally attempt to mimic the biological brain. And so I think that's a, a very crucial advance and the results have been phenomenal. So they've been applied to NLP. And so this is the architecture of the transformer. And uh, there are lots of talks online. Um, and people keep whining that it's very hard to, to understand the architecture of transformers. But one thing that helps somewhat is that this concept of attention can be thought of as a, a query system. You can imagine the way you query, you run a query to extract relevant information out of a database. Um, it's that similar system that extracts some probability of uh, relevance out of all of the information. And uh, those probability coefficients uh, are then used by the network to uh, run computation on what matters. But, and so RNNs really have disappeared because in, in the field of NLP, now transformers are, are the, um, have become the norm. And you, you, you might have heard, were, you might have heard, sorry, of uh, the various GPT, um, like GPT-3, for instance, uh, networks, those are transformers. And they, the, the results are, are pretty amazing. But uh, very, very recently, uh, people have tried to apply transformers to new fields, for instance, to the domain of vision. And one difference between uh, natural language processing and vision is that images tend to be large and they have very many pixels. So when you apply a transformer to vision, astoundingly, it works. It's, it's, it's great. The results are, are great. But uh, SWIN transformer, SWIN standing for shifted windows, uh, came up and allowed to reduce the amount of computation uh, done by the architecture uh, and improved the transformer architecture to the field of vision. And so this state-of-the-art super resolution uh, transformer model is based on SWIN R, on SWIN transformer. So it's called SWIN IR, SWIN uh, because it's based on SWIN transformer, and IR for uh, image restoration, which uh, really means super resolution. So it's SWIN transformers 
that is this optimized version of the transfer, transformer for the field of vision applied to super resolution. So great, I've been telling you, oh, this is the state of the art, but based on what? How, how, can, how can someone compare results of uh, various approaches? Oh yeah, just sorry, uh, I forgot to mention, um, the training sets used for SWIN IR are pretty classic uh, data sets that have been, that are used uh, pretty commonly in the super resolution fields, such as DIV2K, Flickr2K, uh, and they're all available online. But so how do we assess the result of a, a particular model? So there are various metrics, none is perfect. One is the mean opinion score, which is simply an arithmetic mean of subjective quality assessments done by humans. You ask people, okay, do you prefer this image or that image? And you have some rating system and then you score it. And it's not uninteresting, even if it's subjective, because the human eye doesn't see all of the visual information. And depending on your application, if uh, your application is uh, uh, producing something that looks good to humans, well, then focusing the, the result on what the human eye perceives is important. So this is definitely uh, an interesting uh, measure, but, but it's subjective. Something else based uh, on uh, perceived image images by humans, but that is uh, uh, objective and much more quantifiable is the SSIM or Structural Similarity Index Measure. And this is a prediction of perceived image quality based on a perfect reference image. So it compares your SR, super resolution image, to some kind of standard that um, doesn't have any distortion, isn't blurred, is extremely high resolution, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe the most commonly used metrics is the peak signal to noise ratio, PSNR. So this one has nothing to do with human perception. Uh, it's measured in decibel. And what it does, it, it's the ratio of the maximum possible signal to uh, the noise. And the noise is calculated as uh, the mean of squared error. And, and that's calculated at the pixel level. And this is actually very close to lots of the loss functions that are being used in the training of uh, super resolution neural networks. So when I say, oh, this is the state of the art model, or oh, this one does very well, well, it's based on the first two metrics, maybe even the third one. I, I haven't seen it in the literature, but uh, uh, considering how amazing the results look, if anyone has bothered to test the most on those, I think uh, it, it would come up also extremely high. But, oh, uh, I'm having a little scaling issue. Sorry about that. So most at the bottom uh, that you can see, it's, it's simply an arithmetic mean. So it's simply uh, the uh, sum of the Rn divided by uh, capital N, capital N being the number of, number of images. Uh, so PSNR, you have the some um, uh, implementation, SSIM. So anyway, this is those metrics is what you use to assess um, models. How do you implement those methods? Well, in PyTorch, since uh, we're interested in PyTorch right now, but that would apply to uh, TensorFlow or any other uh, framework. Well, you can implement those computations from scratch, for instance, uh, using TorchLog10 and etc. You can also um, look at uh, countless open source projects that are on GitHub. No, uh, for instance, all of those projects that implement those uh, novel and amazing uh, neural networks, for instance, the Swin IR project, because all of the code is open source and in the project, they have a util calculate PSNR SSIN.pi. So they have a Python script that uh, 
defines a number of functions that allow to calculate PSNR and SSIM. So you could, rather than reinvent the wheel, uh, use their implementation. Or you can use some external library, because PyTorch doesn't have um, methods for those metrics. But Cornia is an open source project um, for the field of vision in PyTorch. This is the, their main site. So it's an open source and computer vision library uh, for PyTorch. So it comes up with the number of utilities all written in PyTorch for a number of things that have to do with computer vision. And so amongst other things, they have um, some losses measures and there is a PSNR script and SS SSIM script that uh, defines those functions. So you can uh, quickly assess the quality of a super resol resolution image based on those metrics. So let's look, for instance, at the Cornea functions. You could, so first you have to install the Cornea library since it's a, it's a separate library, it's not part of PyTorch. Then you load the library and then you can uh, simply run those functions uh, with your input, which is your uh, LR image. Uh, no, sorry, your, um, yes, yes, your input is your low resolution image, your target is your SR image, and the max value is um, a float that is based on the maximum uh, ratio that uh, the, the PSNR could have. So most of the time, you just use one. And same thing for the SSIM. You have your two images, window size, which is the dimensions of some window in the uh, image that you want to use for uh, uh, smoothing. So that's an integer, max value, same thing. So one is the default value, uh, etc. So you can see the, the documentations uh, to have more information, but it's easy to implement. Now, in all of those papers, uh, I mentioned very rapidly that Div2K and Flickr2K and other data sets were used for training. There are also some classic benchmark dat data sets that are used to assess the quality of those networks. Uh, there is, for instance, the Berkeley segmentation data sets, there's BSD100, BSD400, etc. Uh, and then set 14 that has 14 images and set 5 that has five images. And the reason, for instance, you see this monarch butterfly come again and again in a lot of the literature, it's because a lot of papers use that open source data set uh, to test their model and compare it with the results of prior models. And the origin of this uh, data set is actually lost. We don't know how it started, but it's been used for at least 18 years. So it's become some kind of classic and some kind of standard to assess SR methods. So how could you get uh, the set five data set and other of those classic data sets if you wanted to, for instance, assess your own model? Well, if you Google it, you can find some archives out there, like some tar or zip files that you can download, but um, a pretty convenient, whoa, sorry. I forgot, uh, sorry, wrong key. Um, a pretty convenient way is to use the Hugging Face website. Hugging Face is an open source um, community driven AI site, mostly focused on NLP, but uh, there are non NLP things. And they have a data set. And for instance, if you are looking for the set five data set and you wonder whether they have it, oh, yeah, they have it. So this is, uh, so it's not done directly by Hugging Face, it's done by this Eugene you uh, person. And uh, so you can find the GitHub repo, which is uh, uh, Eugene is you slash uh, set five. 
you can get some information on how to load it, etc. And that's true of very many data sets. So that's a very good way to uh, find some data sets. And you can find on the Hugging Face site how to load that data set. So you could, uh, so of course you have to install the Hugging Face package called datasets. And then from that package, you can import a function called load dataset and then uh, run it with a number of parameters to uh, 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 like give the name of the data set you're interested in and a number of other information. For instance, the set five data set has various, um, so it's a data set that is made of the high resolution images, and then some low resolution images that were um, done in a number of, ma uh, of different methods. So uh, by cubic times four, they've been upscaled four times uh, with the by cubic um, interpolation algorithm. You also have some upscaling by a factor of two, three, eight. So, uh, this one here uh, uh, allows to create an, an object uh, with the set five data set and an upscaling of four. Uh, set five is now a particular object uh, implemented by Hugging Face. And if you want to uh, look at it, and I will run the code at the very end if we have time, but you can print it, check its length, uh, check its shape, uh, its format. And if you want to use it in a model or um, as part of some PyTorch code, you can set its format to Torch. And you give it uh, column names. The column names are HR and LR in this particular data set for high resolution and low resolution. And you get those columns thanks to column names. So you can quickly go from these um, I mean, it remains a, a hugging face object, but now it is totally compatible to PyTorch code. It is uh, in the proper format, so then you can run it uh, into your code. So that's one way that you can use to access data sets easily. So let's look at benchmarks, because I've been saying, oh yeah, this model is better, etc. but where's the real data? So, 2012 is really the beginning of deep neural network. So very conveniently, there was a big review published at that moment looking at various interpolation methods for super resolution. So this is a good review of what was going on prior to deep neural network. And so uh, it's very hard to see, but I will zoom onto the bottom columns in a bit so that you can see the average. But They've tried a number of algorithms, uh, bicubic, LLMSE, et cetera, and some more complex, um, no, sorry, so that's at the top, some uh, classic algorithm, and then at the bottom, some more complex, much more fancy method that involves some Gauche, uh, Bayesian statistics and some Gaussian stuff, like some very complex algorithm. And they've calculated the PSNR uh, here on the left and SSIM on the right. So if we zoom on the average, so you can't see which algorithm gave what, but what matters are the best results. So, uh, and, and this is the average over a number of images. They did not use set five because um, set five has become really like the benchmark data set in recent years, but at the time it was uh, only started to be used in a few papers, it was less popular, so that's on other images here. But the uh, top uh, peak, uh, peak signal, signal to noise ratio were between 26.6 uh, and 30. And the maximum SSIM were uh, between uh, 0 0.79 and 0 0.87. Now, to compare 
the various architecture and the various methods that are implemented at crazy speed um, on uh, deep learning. One good resource is to look at the papers with code website. It uh, has all sorts of information that has to do with machine learning, but in particular, you can look at benchmarks on particular data sets. So if we look, for instance, at set five for the full time upscaling, you uh, can see over the past few years, uh, the evolution of PSNR, and you can see that very slowly, because it, it's very hard to up PSNR even by a, a very small value, but very slowly things are creeping up and you can look at the best models. You have access, to, you have links to their papers, uh, the GitHub repo where you can find the open source code. Uh, it's really a, a great way to keep an eye on recent advances and to look for particular models that do well in particular um, areas. So it's a, it's a great site. And, and again, you can find the links uh, from the slides. So for set five at four times upscaling, uh, that Swin IR model that came up this year is uh, what does best. And the PSNR is uh, 32.9. So we've crept up at two decibel since uh, the advance of deep learning, which doesn't sound like much, but really is. It's, it's a big, big difference. And the SSIM have crept up from, uh, how was it? It was um, a maximum of 087. And now we are at uh, 090. So it's, it's gone up as well. But what's also extremely interesting about transformers is that not only their PSNR, so their performance, if you want, based on, on that metrics, but that applies to SSIM and other metrics, is superior to others. You have here PSNR in the uh, y-axis. They do so while using relatively few parameters. On the x-axis, you have the number of parameters. And they do better with fewer parameters. So that's amazing. Fewer parameters, that, that, that matters a lot because that means fewer computations. So that means that you don't need as many GPUs. You don't need as much training time. And if you think of it, that makes sense uh, because it's all based on this attention method, attention concept. And while the implementation, if you look at the model architecture and the underlying um, equations, uh, are very complex at the highest level. It's a, a very simple concept. Uh, by focusing on what is relevant and filtering all the, 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 the scatter of information that is irrelevant, you get better performance while reducing computation. That's how the organic brain functions. So well, it makes sense. It's really amazing to see. Uh, so for instance, here, this is a comparison of Swin IR uh, versus a very modern uh, CNN-based model that is called RCAN. And again, this is uh, still based on the, the same data set uh, at uh, four times upscaling. So they're trained on the same set, so DIV2K. Training time is about the same. Swin IR gone trained a little bit longer, 1.8 days instead of 1.6. Um, but what's interesting here is the number of parameters. I mean, to be sure, there are still lots of parameters. There's almost 12 million parameters. So when I say there are fewer parameters, I mean, it's fewer, right? It's relative. Th those architecture are still among us with a lot of parameters and they still require tremendous amount of computation. But until recently, until transformers, the best way to get better results was to increase the amount of data 
and, and make RG lectures bigger and bigger. And now here we have better uh, results with actually a reduction in parameters. So this is pretty great. And if you look at the number of flops, uh, it's also uh, smaller. Not by much, but it's smaller. So uh, on that Swin IR paper, you can see some comparison with other models, such as some GANs. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the, they, it does look uh, better indeed, which you would expect since the um, PNSR, PNSR and SSIM are superior. But I wanted to give it a try on some images. So how could you use Swin IR? Well, the good news is that it is open source. So not just the paper, but the code itself. So you can go to the repo of Swin IR. You can clone the repo. Uh, and you can just run it. And if you look at the readme, they even tell you how you can run it. Because uh, let me quickly show you. Well, actually, I can do that directly from the from the the web. Let me just uh, if you look at the code main test swinir.pi, which is the main uh, uh, script, which does call other scripts. So th there is a bit more running because um, there, there, are, there is some additional, there are two additional scripts that are imported here. So that's not the full code, but you can see that in their definition of the main function that runs the whole thing, they have, um, thanks to parser.add argument, they have implemented a convenient way for the user to pass any number of uh, parameters directly uh, to the function from the command line. So, Thanks to that, you can run the script. So from the command line, calling it with Python, since it's a Python script, with a number of flags. So you have the task flag, the scale flag, the model path flag, etc. cetera. So um, the task flag, for instance, sets which uh, model you are running because they actually define several versions of the model. The scale means um, like, are you uh, trying to upscale by a factor of two or four, etc. cetera. Um, then you have some uh, training patch size. Uh, you can set the uh, model path in PyTorch, when you save a model, it is saved as a file called .pth. So those uh, PTH files are the actual model that has been trained uh, with those uh, training sets, uh, div2k, etc., for almost two days. So those models contain not just the architecture, but also all the weights that have been uh, trained, and then you can set the folder of your images, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in short, if you want to use it, you could just clone the project, CD into it, copy some test images into, for instance, their test set directory. Of even though you don't have to copy it there because. Um, when you run the script, you set uh, the location of your uh, input thanks to the folder LQ uh, flag. You can choose um, the model, etc. Um, one thing 
that I ran into. I, I ran it on my machine and I have one GPU and 32 uh, gig of RAM. I did run into an out of memory issue, but you can solve it thanks to the tile flag uh, by setting a tile to 400. Uh, uh, that allows you to handle the out of memory uh, problem. And, and so I ran it in just nine minutes. So it doesn't take long while I was running it on five images. And here are the results. So each time on the left is the low resolution image that I gave as input. And on the right is the SR image output by Swin IR. And I just found those images uh, online. So this is uh, Berlin in 1945. Uh, and this is if we zoom in to this section here, because the difference is pretty striking when I zoom on the pictures, but here it's not all that obvious. So I zoomed in on this tiny part of that column here, and here we really see the difference. Like Twin IR transformed some real uh, blurriness into something that if you squint and look really hard, you can see there are a few artifacts, but something that looks Frankly, I mean, almost perfect. It's, it's pretty impressive, I, I think. Another uh, Berlin 1945 image. And then I'm going to zoom onto that person here next to the car. And here again, you can see how um, Swin IR handled it. And uh, what's interesting in this example is that the high resolution version of these images simply doesn't exist. So these images uh, were certainly not part of the training set of Swin IR. Uh, there is this SR image that uh, it uh, output does not have a real world uh, HR image anywhere. Uh, and yet, I mean, it, it's doing really great. So then I wanted to, to test on a totally different type of image. This is a, a Bruegel, uh, the elder painting. And same thing, LR on the left, SR to the right. And I'm going to zoom into those uh, three central characters here. And here again, the result is, uh, I mean, pretty spectacular. So for this one, there is a real Bruegel painting somewhere. Uh, I don't know in which museum, to be honest. And so uh, this one, there, uh, there should be, uh, or, or we could have an HR image someplace and we could then compare it, but I don't have access to it. And then this is a Vasarely painting because I wanted to try on something totally different again. And there again, uh, I mean, it performs pretty darn well. And then this ugly image with uh, really blurry birds in the center and pretty amazing. I mean, there are some artifacts, um, but considering the starting point, it's, it's pretty good. And if we want to implement, and I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, but uh, we're, we're almost done. If we want to clearly uh, see what PSNR and SSIM we get on these images, uh, we can import Cornea. Uh, from Peel, we import images. This is an um, uh, image. Peel is a it's, it's Pilo, it's a Python library that allows to handle images. Then we need Torch, and uh, from Torch Vision, we'll import transforms, which is the module that has all of the uh, image transformation uh, methods. We can uh, create some Python image objects thanks to Image Open from the Pilo library. And then we can display those images if we want. Uh, uh, by running uh, the object.show, and then it's going to just pop up the image. But we need to transform them into uh, PyTorch tensors. So first, we will create a function thanks to the compass function of the transforms um, uh, module that came from Torch Vision. We will resize the image because our low resolution image is going to be much smaller than the super resolution image. And if we want to, in order to calculate uh, PSNR and uh, SSIM, they have to be of the same size. So we resize them. 
and then we transfer them to Tensor. So by running our Python object through this function that we've just created, now we have a tensor. And if we look at the shape of those tensors, they're torch tensors and they have three dimensions. The first dimension is the number of channels. We have three channels because of the three color channels, R, B, and G. And then we have um, the height and the width of the image in pixel. Now, because anything you do in uh, deep learning usually involves treating batches of images, the vast majority of functions uh, deal with four dimension neural networks with a first dimension at the start, which is the size of the batch. So we will transform our torch tensor that has three dimension into torch tensors that have four dimensions, thanks to the unsqueeze function from torch. And uh, this, so I'm passing my torch tensors through that function. And the second argument is the index at which we add a new dimension. So because the batch size is usually at the start, I'm adding that new dimension at the index zero. So I'm creating two new torch tensors, which this time have four dimensions. The, four, the first dimension being the batch size. And because I have only one image, the batch size is one. But now thanks to these two uh, torch tensors of the proper dimensions, I can simply run them into those cornea functions and I get a PSNR of 33.38, which is really, really great. And an SSIM of, of like really close to one, which is amazing because um, uh, I mean, uh, one would be the absolute uh, maximum for uh, an SSIM. So I am five minutes over time. I apologize for that. So if you have to run, feel free. Uh, if you do have some questions though, I'll be happy to stick around to try to answer your questions. So feel free to unmute yourself or you can type in the chat. And um, yeah, if you want to throw some comments or if you have any question. So are you talking about the training process or the process of actually creating the super resolution image? Because if we are talking about actually using the Swin IR uh, model, for instance, right. Uh, so it, it, for me to create those five images, it only took nine minutes and I have one. So I'm using a laptop with a dedicated GPU. So it's not, as performant as a real GPU on a, a desktop, but it's still a dedicated GPU. And I have 32 gig of RAM, which isn't bad. It took nine minutes. So if you have um, a, a GPU, an average GPU on a desktop, it's gonna be absolutely no problem. If you do it on CPU, it's gonna take uh, a fair bit longer. I don't know how long it would take because I haven't tried it, but often, and, and it depends a lot, but often GPUs speed things up by a factor of 50. So uh, it could be nine times 50 minutes if you didn't have a GPU. And if you don't have a lot of RAM, you may, add, may run into out of memory issues. So you might have to play with the tile uh, flag to uh, solve your out of memory issue. If you were running this, uh, and of course, don't do it, just uh, don't use Cedar just to produce some uh, uh, poster size desktop images or something silly. But if it were relevant for your research, and if you were running this on Cedar, I mean, that would be extremely quick and easy. Uh, so the the creation of the image, the, the usage of the already trained model isn't that heavy. What was heavy, of course, as always in uh, machine learning is the actual training of the model. Because here, 
I am not doing any training. I am making use of uh, this model, this uh, PTH file, which has already been trained. So all the parameters are already uh, optimized, et cetera, et cetera. The training um, that was done on uh, DIV2K took almost two days uh, with um, a, a GPU at GeForce uh, RTX, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, so it's not, it's not insane. You could totally do the training on your own machine if you had a GPU. Um, yeah, so okay. yeah, thanks, Marie, for writing. Actually, I was thinking about, I mean, my image domain is kind of big, like, uh, I mean, actually, I'm mean, doing with uh, brain connectivity data. The this seems like, seems like a really good opportunity to explore some of the things. So, I mean, but my purpose for asking that question was that my image size is kind of 1024 rows into 1024 columns. So it's kind of a big image. Uh, yes, but that's that's okay because uh -huh. um, um, the um, some training can be done if you want to train a model training can be done on subsection of the images uh, if you look at the code in a lot of the of those models they don't use ent the entire images in the div 2k or flickr 2k data set they crop a certain section on the low resolution image and the exact the, the matching section on the high resolution image, and they only use the, those samples to do the training. So, and then they uh, extrapolate it. So to run it though, uh, I don't know whether you can do some sort of cropping or not, but there, there might be a way. So if you can run it on only fraction of the image, that might reduce that burden a lot. Uh, to be explored, that, that is something that I actually don't know. For training, I know that it is totally an option. Mm -hmm. To produce your output, I have no idea whether there's anything that can extrapolate from samples of images, maybe not. But in any event, if this is for work, if this mm -hmm. is part of your research project, you mm -hmm. can make use of uh, the Compute Canada clusters for that. In, and if that were the case, I wouldn't launch something crazy on a ton of images. I would make sure to first select one or two images and run it just on that to see what the results are, to see whether uh, you are getting the kind of information that you're interested in. Like I would test small, before mm -hmm. scaling up, but um, but you certainly could use uh, th that resource to uh, to run things if it is relevant to your research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. And I see there is a question about the architectural description. Yeah, I, I threw over that to be honest. I really didn't uh, dwell much on it. So uh, this is a schematic of Swin IR. Uh, but I don't know whether uh, this is the actual real number of um, layers. I doubt it. I think this is just a schematic that explains the architecture. If you want to um, have information, you have to go to the paper, which is open source, and look at uh, things in, in, de in detail and uh, transformers are a bit doubting. So um, I have it on, on my machine, but uh, I thought uh, I would re-download it to show you the way to get to it. Okay, so let's zoom in a bit. Okay, so... Uh, uh, ta -dun, ta -dun. So there, this is where that little schematic I 
to came from, but uh, so you'd have to read the paper uh, if you want some detail and so, but let's see. So, uh, the description of the model architecture is higher. Okay, network architecture. Well, they actually don't give that much uh, detail about the model architecture in the in the paper, but you can you can look at the code also uh, and 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 dive into it. Yeah, I think that looking into into the code might actually be better because the the papers doesn't uh, doesn't dwell into the details. So the code you have this main test swinar. Um, a file, but it calls the um, this paper. So to answer your question, you have to go into the models directory, and then the network SwinIR PI, because this is where they define all of those various uh, models that you can call thanks to uh, those flags when you uh, call the main script from the command line. So. This is where it's on that file. I can pass the link in the chat that you will see uh, the actual architecture of all of those um, uh, models. So this is where uh, you'll find all the answer. Yeah, yeah, I think this is the, the best way to answer your question. Yes, so nine minutes was to uh, process my five images. Uh, if I had run it on 200 images, uh, yes, I suspect it would have taken a lot longer because in, whoops, uh, sorry, there we go. Um, you have the option when you run those models to set the path for where your test set is um, uh, like this is the, the, the one I use is this one. Uh, I use the folder LQ uh, flag that allows to give the path to a folder with all of my low resolution images. So yes, I batch processed uh, five images. Yes, yes, yes. And while uh, RNNs, for instance, um, in NLP used to be hard to parallelize, that's not true at all of transformers. So yes, transformers can uh, parallelize and run on GPU very nicely. So um, uh, even if you run this on a single GPU, you're already, already parallelizing uh, tremendously because a single GPU ran very many computations in parallel. And so um, when I did it on my own machine, I already ran this uh, uh, in a vastly parallelized uh, fashion. So, and yes, you can run it on the, on the Compute Canada cluster and uh, make use of more resources. But again, as I mentioned earlier, before you run something like this or anything for that matter on the Compute Canada clusters, don't run it on don't start with something big and make small tests first to ensure that what you are doing is what you really want so don't process 200 images um, right away process a handful of images ensure that this is really what you need what you want that things are uh, that the output you are getting is uh, matching your expectations before launching something larger <clears throat> 